Okay. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, Madam. I am your host for today's webinar, Latika. It's a Hi. pleasure meeting you. Same here, Latika. How are you doing? I'm. I I think, Doctor, uh, the mic is mute. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? All okay? Yes. Yeah, Latika, yeah, Latika, I will play the first three videos. So after that, you can go ahead, okay? Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So still, how much we have time? horizontally onto, onto the, the collection, collection card and lightly touch, touch the blood the drop to fill in the pre-printed circles. Dry the card for 15-20 minutes away from the sunlight at room temperature. Our team will then collect the cake box from your home on the same day. That's it. Now just relax and you shall receive your report by mail within 3 days once it reaches our lab. Based on our results, your doctor can recommend dietary changes or supplements if necessary. Nurture a healthy pregnancy journey with life Order your fully equipped home collection kit online. On the day that you decide to take the test, book the kit collection by clicking on the link provided by the Lifecell team before 11.30 am in the morning. Now take the collection card outside the aluminium pouch, clean your breast with the swab provided, dab a drop of breast milk directly onto the collection card or collect breast milk in a container and use a dropper, place one drop of breast milk on the collection card. Dry the card for 15 to 20 minutes away from sunlight at room temperature. A team will then collect the kit box from your home on the same day. That's it. Now just sit back and relax and you shall receive your results in 7 days once your sample reaches our labs. Based on your results, your doctor can make recommendations regarding dietary changes or supplements if necessary. Nurture your baby's healthy mind. Yes, latex. I try and avoid them at all costs. I don't even know these chemicals. All I want is the safety of my child. 87% mothers are concerned about the safety of baby products, which is why all Philips Avent products are made with 0% BPA, BPS, latex and sulfur and are tested for assured safety. That's why I only feel safe choosing Philips Avent products. With Philips Avent, I know my child's safety is assured. If it's Philips Avent, both me and my child are safe. Philips Avent, the number one recommended brand by moms worldwide. All right. So good morning, everybody. And I would like to welcome you all on a lovely and a beautiful Saturday morning where we are going to get a lot of knowledge regarding the C-section. Um, you know, before, during and after, what are the terms and clauses and all the rushing thoughts that every lady is going through in, you know, conceiving during these kind of times. It's difficult, but here today, we are having Dr. Archana Ramesh comes with an extensive experience of more than a decade and a half as obstetrician and gynecologist. If you are looking forward to meet a highly patient-centric and qualified doctor, Dr. Arjuna is the go-to person. She has completed her MBBS and DG Go DGO from JSS Medical College, Mysore. 
and she has a passion towards obstetrics and gynecology so which motivated her to pursue mrcog from royal college uk so dr archana is here amongst us to take away all your questions and guide you throughout whatever queries you have ladies and gentlemen i would like to request you you can put it in the chat section in this webinar we are going to take up one by one questions and your queries and try to solve as many as we can so uh, welcome you dr archana ramesh um, so honor to have you amongst us Over thank you so much yeah okay thank you so much latika very kind words about me uh, thank you once again so uh, uh, when uh, our team came to me and asked to select a topic you know what would you want to talk on i knew a lot of people would say covid but i thought let's talk about cesarean because that is one of the most common procedures women are undergoing nowadays especially in their lifetime irrespective of whether covid is there or not so yeah. with that in mind i just wanted to you know educate uh, bring out some light on cesarean what it actually means why it is done the do's and don'ts associated with the uh, cesarean uh, you know can anybody have a normal delivery after a cesarean simple things like this which have encountered most commonly uh, you know with my patients who have asked me uh, these questions so this was the idea uh, behind uh, choosing this topic and i hope uh, our audience today will benefit from it from my end so uh, Uh, so what do we uh, shall i just proceed with the uh, talk or uh, yeah sure however it is comfortable for you doctor uh, we can go yeah. ahead with the presentation and once that yeah. is done we can see all the questions which are there in the chat box okay super so let me just uh, give uh, a rough idea about what cesarean is and everything and then as you said uh, any questions we can um, you know clarify we will do it at the end of this session so sure. so what do we understand by cesarean okay so basically uh, it is the delivery of either uh, a live or a dead baby through an incision made on the tummy into the uterus okay obviously we need to keep in mind that the baby is viable because viability is a period wherein we know that the baby has the capacity to survive for example in india 24 weeks 26 weeks is considered as the pre, uh, period of viability if we have to operate for any reason before this then it is known as a hysterectomy and not a cesarean okay now the second thing is obviously everybody is nowadays concerned about the increasing incidence of cesarean you know everywhere we hear uh, you know the people come and tell us that yes we have had a previous caesar we have had a previous caesar why is this happening what are the reasons which we can attribute this to most commonly it is because of increased anesthetic methods you know the kind of anesthesia techniques which we have developed the presence of antibiotics because obviously uh, you know anesthesia is extremely important for any surgery and we need a good antibiotic cover to prevent infection and thus morbidity and mortality associated with any surgical procedure obviously cesarean is still a major surgery therefore improved blood transfusion uh, facilities available has also so increased the uh, rates of cesarean obviously other than that uh, you know better medical access we want to make sure that the baby is safe the mother is safe because nowadays nobody thinks of having 6 7 8 9 10 children so each pregnancy is considered as precious so uh, you know that that uh, sort of an attitude is there among all couples there i mean not judging but that is very true okay and a uh, lot of women are concerned about the trauma when they have to undergo a normal delivery you know to the perineal muscles and the pelvic floor and the risk of incontinence you know after a normal delivery uh, whether it is um, a urinary incontinence lot of them have fecal incontinence as well and other than that obviously avoidance of labor pains uh, uh, you know labor pain is something which cannot be coped by lot of women so you know the suddenly they say no we can't go through it let's go for a cesarean and obviously convenience and other i would say down the list you know this muhurtam and good timing and vastu and all these things do come into play okay so uh because now cesarean has proven to be quite a safe procedure 
because of this increasing uh, rates of cesarean which we are seeing both the indications and as well as the rate at which we are doing cesarean is always under constant review for example you know in the early 19th century or the early 20th century uh, around 10 to 15% of uh, deliveries it was considered okay to have a cesarean but now that number has gone up almost around 25 to 30% so out of 100 women who deliver 30 of them can have a cesarean delivery because of whatever reason okay that is the accepted rate at the moment and obviously there is a distinct variation between private hospitals as well as government hospitals or teaching hospitals this uh, uh, obviously the private uh, sector is scoring higher rates than you know government setups or uh, teaching hospitals uh, most commonly why we are seeing cesarean is because of obviously the previous uh, uh, delivery being a cesarean breach presentation that is the baby's head is not down and the bum is down and also there is an increased uh, uh, in vitro fertilization techniques which are being employed to gain pregnancy which is resulting in multiple gestation and most of them are precious pregnancy the doctor or the parents are not uh, comfortable to go through a normal delivery in such high risk situations. So as I said, uh, why do we do a cesarean? What is the most common factors which would make us think about a cesarean is we many times, even if the patient has gone into labor, we feel that the baby's heartbeat is uh, not up to the mark. It can be slow or fast or, you know, the baby may have passed meconium. So we assume that the labor process uh, is stressing out the baby and the baby is sending us distress signals, wanting us to do a cesarean. So that is one reason. The second reason is failure to progress. A lot of them actively go into spontaneous labor, but unfortunately they don't progress well because see, in a primary in a mom who is uh, uh, become pregnant for the first time we expect this full dilatation to take almost around 10 to 12 hours time but beyond this it's difficult for us also to wait uh, but for multis this is lesser it's around six to eight hours despite this time uh, and the expected rate of dilatation if it does not happen that is when we think about cesarean and as i said repeat cesarean and breach are other common indications here yeah, you wanted to uh, ask something, Latika? No, I am just uh, getting so involved in this that. Okay. <laughs> all right, okay. Sorry, um, it's a bit of a science class, I suppose, today for all. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, uh, coming to indications, we classify the indications as two uh, main uh, groups. One is absolute indication, wherein what it means is there is no, no possibility at all of having a normal delivery, okay? And the second one is relative indication. So this relative is something which is obviously patient dependent, but this is further classified into two things. For example, it could be an elective, a non-emergency uh, based, for example, if you have had a previous cesarean, you'll think, okay, this time let me have a cesarean at this and this day. So that is an elective, uh, you know, option of opting for cesarean on a particular fixed date and time. Whereas the other thing is what is known as an emergent or a non-elective uh, but relative indication. What it means is now let's say everything is going well. Suddenly we realize that the baby has passed motion and is uh, the heartbeat is uh, you know not up to the mark. In such situation, the cause has emerged. So uh, as uh, unexpectedly we are uh, unfortunately having to go ahead to do a cesarean. So that is a, a relative cause for uh, you know emergent cesarean section so I've just uh, mentioned you know what all we can think of for example as i said absolute if there is a fibroid or uh, uh, you know malignancy a cancer affecting the lower portion of the cervix or the pelvis is absolutely tiny which is very common in asian population then there's no possibility of the baby coming down the birth canal it is it is just not uh, impossible to fathom okay whereas with uh, um, relative let's say the pelvis is good but the baby is too big now let's say the baby is around 4 kg plus then even for a good uh, uh, pelvis again this is a tough uh, uh, you know choice for it, the baby to negotiate through the birth canal because of the size of the baby so there is a relative sort of a difference between the size of the pelvis and the weight of the baby uh, any bleeding or uh, you know 
uh what to say uh if there is any previous birth injury she has had a perineal third degree or a fourth degree tear in her previous delivery so these are some of the uh, maternal causes i would say in terms of causes uh, wherein we look at the baby obviously you know if the mom is hiv positive uh, or if there is any malpresentation you know oblique lie transverse lie or breach and obviously the other most important is the placenta the position of the placenta if it is down and blocking the birth canal then obviously the the chances of baby coming out is difficult so coming to the before story so what do we uh, so these are the few indications uh, of uh, cesarean and why we go ahead and do the cesarean now coming to the procedure as such what do we do what, what are the expected and unexpected things which can happen before during and after the cesarean coming to the before story first is obviously we need to make sure that there is adequate uh, you know uh, hemoglobin is perfect and the patient is not anemic so one of the most uh, common reasons of morbidity and mortality in india is still considered as anemia in pregnancy so that is the reason why we start giving uh, you know uh, iron and calcium tablets in the antenatal period so so that the mom has a good store of iron when she comes to the moment of delivery be it a normal delivery or a cesarean because we can expect somewhere between 500 mls to 1 liter of blood uh, blood loss whatever the mode of delivery so anemia correction is very important this holds very true especially when uh, the mom has a negative blood group because it's not that easy to find a negative blood group so we need to make sure that uh, you know uh, hemoglobin and blood is not a uh, problem at the time of delivery especially a cesarean section other thing is obviously the patient needs to be on empty stomach at least uh, our anesthetists believe 6 to 8 hours prior to the procedure itself because what happens is when we give anesthesia the lower part of the body including the gastrointestinal tract is paralyzed so the intestinal movement becomes very sluggish and it's almost absent so if you we, we generally try to avoid operating on a full stomach because this can land up uh, with uh, you know nausea vomiting and things like that later on uh, after the uh, uh, delivery um most common medications which we use is obviously you know uh, to suppress gastric secretions we use antacids antiemetics and antibiotics to cover any risk of infection um the other thing which we need to keep in mind is many women will be on lot of medications which has to be stopped at least 3 to 5 days prior to the surgery for example blood thinning medications uh, like ecosprin or uh, low molecular weight heparin injections which are used in certain group of uh, uh, women okay uh, coming to the most important aspect of this is informed written consent what this means is the patient should be fully aware and understand the indication that is why we are doing the cesarean what is the risk of cesarean intraoperatively postoperatively and what is the benefit we are targeting to gain by doing the cesarean you know safety of the baby safety of the mother pertaining to the particular situation because each patient is different so generally uh, i definitely encourage uh, all this discussion uh, prior to uh, you know shifting to the theater until and unless there's an absolute emergency wherein i know that i'm doing the cesarean to save the mother's life only then i don't have to think about consent otherwise obviously uh, the the mom as well as her partner should be involved in this decision making process the other thing is obviously the anesthesia aspect of it uh, so uh, generally lot of women who plan for a delivery be it a normal or a cesarean if uh, required we get an anesthetic checkup done around 34 weeks of pregnancy itself for for example a woman who is obese or a woman who is hypertensive or a woman with diabetes or any other medical uh, comorbidities we generally ask the anesthetist to have a look so that you know decisions uh, can be made easily as and when it happens for example even during normal labor if you have discussed about uh, epidural with 
the patient it makes life much easier uh, with cesarean obviously you know especially for emergency situations we may not have much time to do a pae as such but then again uh, you know for elective cesareans generally uh, if required the anesthetist will have a say beforehand itself and what is the kind of anesthesia given this will also be discussed for example you know we give regional anesthesia that is spinal which is most commonly given for all kinds of cesarean section only in certain situations we think about giving general anesthesia when the patient is completely knocked out but as much as possible we want to avoid general anesthesia uh because of the recovery rates and things like that okay so coming to the next slide so what happens during cesarean you know okay now coming to once we have taken the decision to go ahead with the cesarean what happens next so obviously the patient needs to be shifted to the theater and in the theater the patients are highly tensed worried confused too many people you know the doctor the assistants the staff nurses uh, the pediatrician their assistant the anesthetist the anesthetist assistant so so many people will be around so generally we all of us we like to introduce ourselves to make sure that the patient is comfortable with the number of people who are in the theater uh the next most important thing is you know catheterization so what happens is during cesarean uh when we give the spinal anesthesia obviously the effects last for around 6 to 8 hours during which uh, time the patient will not be able to get up mobile herself to the bathroom and visit the loo and obviously bladder is one of those structures which is directly in front of the uterus so we want to make sure that it is safe also during the procedure and hence we put in a tube what we call as a catheter so that the you know the urine output everything is uh, comfortable for the patient and it's convenient for us also to monitor the anesthesia aspects obviously as i said the our anesthetist will be taking care of it and uh, generally what happens is uh, they will give local anesthesia and then actually give the spinal anesthesia this takes around 8 to 10 minutes to act so uh, i'm not sure if we should be really worried that you know the uh, anesthesia has not acted and we have started the surgery am i going to have pain no nothing of that sort we generally make sure we cross check that you know uh, the anesthesia has worked has set in and only then once the anesthetist gives us the nod we start with the procedure now during the procedure many a times uh, women will be able to feel the push pull the tug uh, and the touch sensation but obviously there should not be any pain uh, perception at all and to extract the baby uh, we generally the anesthetist help us uh, give by giving a push from the top of the uterus so that the baby comes out uh as uh, as easily as possible so once the baby comes out uh, i have the habit of trying to show the baby immediately even whilst the cord has not been cut uh to the mom and then we wait for uh, this uh, delayed cord uh, clamping until and unless there is a specific indication not to do so and then we hand over the baby to our neonatal team who then uh, do whatever is required for the baby and um, during this procedure uh, we give certain medications to mom to make sure that the uterus is contracting well there is minimal bleeding and she is otherwise comfortable and then we come out so this is about the actual uh, issue uh, not issue actual uh, sort of a uh, you know play what happens inside the theater i also encourage husbands or partners to be with uh, the moms when they are going through this procedure because obviously someone familiar will keep them calm and their vitals are quite stable in terms of blood pressure pulse and things like that so obviously uh like any other surgery cesarean section uh, can have certain complications um uh, 12 to 15% of cesarean sections land up having unexpected challenges for example if you start from the beginning anesthesia itself uh, it may be difficult to give local and uh, give spinal anesthesia we may need to have multiple attempts which can later on uh, lead to sort of headache and other such symptoms uh, the spinal anesthesia may not work wherein we may have to think of converting 
to a, a general anesthesia because the spinal has not worked well. So this is the uh, few aspects of complications associated with anesthesia. Coming to surgery as such, it depends on a lot of factors. First of all, if there is any comorbidities, medical comorbidities for the mother like diabetes, hypertension, or she's an asthmatic or an epileptic. So, you know, uh, the stress and the anxiety itself can cause, uh, you know, issues. Obviously, previous any abdominal surgery, you know, it could be a simple appendicectomy or it could be a simple, you know, previous cesarean itself. Uh, obviously, this increases the risk of radiation and the risk of complications during the current surgery. So it is imperative that we assess the risk factors and have a plan in place uh, as far as, uh, you know, expecting the unexpected is concerned. Uh, like any surgery, three things extremely important. One is bleeding. One is injury to the surrounding structures. Uh, and the third one is infection. Infection nowadays, it has the rates of infection has come down very less because of the fantastic antibiotics which are available currently. Risk of bleeding, it could be because the uterus is not contracting well, which we call as a tonic bleeding, or there could be uh, lacerations, difficult extractions, and wherein we have had to, uh, you know, sort of extend the incision made on the uterus, or if it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, a big baby or uh, a deeply engaged baby wherein we have done the cesarean at the last minute, you know, in the second stage of labor, things like that increase the risk of bleeding, which could be, as I said, either traumatic or a toning. Uh, injury to the surrounding structures. This is also quite important. The surrounding structures most commonly affected are the bladder, the ureters and the bubble. So uh, as but the risk is very low. I would say it's around 0 0.8 per thousand is what the literature quotes, which is very, very less. Again, this is more if there is any history of previous uh, adhesions or previous infections leading to uh, adhesions or previous abdominal surgeries. And now, what do we do after the cesarean? So obviously, because... Uh, you know, the patient is uh, from the theater. She is shifted to the recovery for the immediate post-op uh, period, wherein uh, she is kept nil by mouth because we want the bubble and the intestines to start acting, which will take around six to eight hours and only then give orally. Otherwise, again, vomiting is a concern. We continue to have the catheter in place uh, till she becomes mobile. We continue IV fluids because uh, she's not having anything orally. We want to maintain hydration and we monitor her uh, blood pressure, uh, you know, uh, pulse rate, her oxygen sats. We want to make sure that the uterus is contracted and make sure that she's not bleeding excessively. So medications which we normally give include antibiotics, painkillers. Yes, uh, this thromboprophylaxis, that means... So this is a medication which we give to prevent clot formation. So surgery, blood loss, um, uh, you know, uh, weight of the patient being on the higher end, obesity, uh, you know, hypertension, gerium. These are all, uh, you know, uh, situations which increase the risk of clot formation. So we make sure that, you know, appropriate thromboprophylaxis, many a times we just help them with stockings to the legs or we may have to give certain medications to help them uh, combat this clot formation. Right. So uh, before this, uh, I'm sorry, there's a slide which has been missed. So recovery in terms of what happens once the patient is shifted from the post-op ward to the ward. So we expect the hospital stay to be around uh, 72 hours post-surgery. Uh, as soon as possible, we want to mobilize the patient. We want uh, the catheter to be out and so that she is comfortable walking around using the washroom. Many a times, if required, we uh, help them with uh, physio therapy, calf exercises and chest exercises if uh, as the situation warrants. Uh, generally by day two, uh, there is gradual decrease in the pain as well because first six to eight hours because you're on the spinal uh, uh, the pain is actually not as bad as you would have thought it would be. But once this wears off, you know, the, the, the pain, it will take around 24 to 48 hours for it to settle down and become bearable. So we usually help them either with the IV painkillers or oral painkillers, depending on the uh, uh, person, you know, how, how comfortable the patient is. Um, 
once uh, generally i like to do uh, a complete blood count before sending the patient home just to make sure that you know her hemoglobin is good and there's no sign of infection with total count being normal so once this is done i i i would generally like to send the patients as soon as possible not keep them even a minute more than what is required in the hospital um, common questions is you know tying of cloth around the tummy uh, i think these are indian practices so that can be done use of belt i generally like recommend after 6 weeks because the lower edge of the the lower edge of the uh, you know the belt it sits on the scar so unnecessary rubbing can be avoided if you can start using the belt after 6 weeks in terms of diet uh, and uh, nutrition make sure you eat healthy lots of uh, fruits veggies high fiber diet make sure you're not constipated and water please plenty of fluids such extremely important to make sure that your lactation is going well to make sure that you don't land up with urinary tract infection okay so what are the post operative uh, unexpected but Uh, common uh, situations which we can see uh, during the recovery phase uh, any sort of infection of the wound itself can happen um, and there can be infection inside the uterus what we call as endometritis uh, but generally we are able to manage these with uh, antibiotics urinary infection again lack of water most important cause lack of fluids most important cause for uh urinary infection and cough and uh, uh, you know upper respiratory uh, issues can also happen again uh, clot formation infection of the clots in the veins and the transfer of those clots to the lungs causing breathlessness dyspnea and chest symptoms can also happen especially in a certain category of women so uh, you know uh, thromboprophylaxis is very 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 important the other most important uh, complication uh, fairly uncommon but we uh, sometimes do see is palatic ileus so what this means is there is generally distension of the tummy it's generally a gaseous distension which happens uh, because uh, the the uh, intestines are not moving enough they are not mobile enough so there is accumulation of uh, you know flatus inside the tummy leading to distension but this can be quite severe leading to nausea many times can be associated with loose stools as well so generally we make sure that the electrolytes are good and slowly start uh, the oral transition you know you start with uh, liquids then semi solid then solid and generally they tend to recover within 4 to 5 days hematoma formation this can happen anywhere Uh, at any point of time at any site in the surgery uh, you know for example it could be just under the skin or it could be under the rectus sheath uh, that is the muscle or it could be anywhere even on the uterus so uh, the most classic symptom is persistent pain we should think about this problem right so um, we all know that cesarean one of the most important indication for cesarean is that we want to make sure that the baby is healthy yeah but does this happen all the time yes we have done a cesarean does this guarantee a good and a safe and a healthy uh, neonatal outcome uh, there are a few concerns even with cesarean but this primarily will depend on why we have done the cesarean for example intrapartum during labor either the first stage of labor or in second stage of labor if at any point of time there has been uh, you know some sort of a fetal distress and for that reason we have done a cesarean it's not necessary that just because we have done the cesarean the baby is going to be one 100% happy and healthy no it does not mean that especially if uh, you know we are doing the cesarean because of that particular reason so it does not guarantee that everything is going to be okay but ultimately we do it because that's the best thing we can do to give the best outcome for the baby that's it okay uh, fetal lacerations so many a times many a times what happens is when we are trying to put an incision on the uterus and we are getting the baby out inadvertently we can put a nick on the baby this can happen in 2 out of 100 cesareans it is not a life threatening problem but obviously you know it is something which has an emotional and a sentimental score on both the doctor as well as the mother so unfortunately it is fairly common and the second thing is is more common especially when there is dry labor that is there is no the fluid around the baby is very less or there is abnormal position of the baby 
many times even in breach this will happen and this also injury to the baby can also happen for example uh, dislocation of the arms or legs when you are trying to get the baby out but that is extremely 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 rare hardly seen many um the other thing is obviously neonatal respiratory distress syndrome or transient tachypnea of newborn. What this huge term means is basically the baby is having some breathing issues. It is very well observed that for whatever reason, when we do a cesarean, the risk of breathing issues is slightly higher when compared to a vaginal delivery. This is simply because of the chest compression which happens during a vaginal delivery does not happen during cesarean section. Uh, so that is the only reason. The other two important things is iatrogenic prematurity. So this is what it means is iatrogenic means it is medically induced. Prematurity is anything less than 37 weeks. So when we decide or when we take a call on uh, fixing a date for the cesarean, many times if the dates, the mom is not sure of the dates, we may think it is 37 weeks and ultimately do a cesarean and then understand once the baby comes out that the baby is still around 34 weeks. So this is something which is a bit, uh, you know, a bit of an issue uh, with iatrogenic prematurity because whatever said and done, you know, the scans and, uh, uh, you know, the radiology can only help us so much in terms of understanding the maturity of the babies. So that is the reason why most of elective cesarean sections we plan between 38 to 39 weeks. All right. And uh, the next one is, yes, coming to this very interesting last bit of my talk, once a cesarean, always a cesarean. So this is one of the most, most, uh, I would say, favorite question of all of my patients, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, who, who are uh, quite anxious to understand the, the dilemma of, uh, you know, this uh, situation, you know. So uh, there is no hard and fast rule that, uh, if it is a cesarean, it has to be always a cesarean. If you remember, I had just mentioned about, you know, absolute indications for cesarean previously. Yeah, when we spoke about when, why we do the cesarean. So in such scenarios, it means that cesarean is a must. For example, if a, a patient has undergone cesarean for a contracted pelvis, a small pelvis, the pelvis is not going to change in its size. So definitely the cesarean is the only way for her to have a delivery. So in such situations, situation yes cesarean is a cesarean uh, if there has been an absolute indication when it has been done for the first time is there any limit to the number of cesarean yes i have had two more children can i have two more cesareans again you know so till date the 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 documented number of cesareans vary between six to eight so as i said there's no hard and fast rule that at this cesarean if you this many number of cesareans you have had you need to cut it off you you can't become pregnant again no there's nothing like that okay why are we worried what is the factor which makes us think so hard about you know cesarean and a delivery you know the fear is obviously we would have put a stitch on the uterus when we have taken the baby out that uh, stitch how has it healed what is the strength of that scar because in the subsequent pregnancy the scar is again stretched it is thinned out and during contraction the scar is again uh, put under a lot of pressure will it open up so that is the uh, you know, uh, fear factor here, which motivates most doctors to, you know, think twice before telling, yes, you can go for a normal vaginal delivery. But VBAC or vaginal birth after a cesarean, uh, that is one of the most complicated aspects in modern obstetrics because they, we need a lot of tick boxes. We, may, we want to make sure that, you know, everything is in place before we actually attempt this and even attempting a trial of VBAC does not guarantee a vaginal delivery because the, the chances of success is only around 50 percent even if you try for a vaginal delivery so and the risk and complications uh, which happen during the emergency cesarean when we do after a failed VBAC is slightly higher so you know we really really think hard before accepting uh, this option of uh, allowing for a vaginal delivery after a cesarean. In, in certain situations, 
it's an absolute no no for example if there is any medical comorbidities hypertension or uh, you know diabetes the baby is big uh, you know the placental position the the size of the baby all these factors will make an influence on the ultimate decisions good candidates are those who have already had a uh, a vaginal delivery prior to section and if they going to labor on their own that's the best aspect of it right and my last last slide uh, you know uh, is uh, any other procedures which we can do sterilization is something which a lot of uh, multi paris women opt for uh, during cesarean but please keep in mind only during elective cesarean if the cesarean now let's say a person has chosen 5th of july as the date of delivery if everything goes well and we do the cesarean as on the date uh, scheduled then not an issue but uh, let's say she lands up in active labor and for whatever reason we land up doing the cesarean prior to that in emergency cesarean sections we generally try to avoid sterilization now because this is considered as one of the permanent procedures now the other thing is you know uh, ovarian tumors many times uh, uh, you know uh, women opt for getting the tumors out as well during the cesarean cesarean myomectomy that is removal of fibroid with cesarean during cesarean we have to bear in mind this pregnancy is a hyper volemic state that means the circulation of blood is too much so all these procedures are associated with increased risk of blood loss so the rule of thumb which i prefer is if we can avoid concurrent procedures there is nothing like that until and unless it's absolutely warranted then yes we can do it but otherwise if we can avoid uh, making additional incisions when we know that the blood supply is already more and the risk of bleeding is high it's not worth it okay cesarean hysterectomy unfortunately around 1 in 10000 women land up having their uterus removed during cesarean this could be because of various reasons most common is you know either it is because of excessive bleeding wherein whatever medications or stitches we've been able to do we are still unable to control the bleeding this can happen unfortunately this can happen and such women land up having hysterectomies that is one in 10000 that number is too 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 uh, you know um, uh, high so you don't have to worry about it just because we do our uh, we are doing a cesarean does not mean that you land up with uh, hysterectomy the other reason is if there is any scar rupture okay so other than this i am unable to think of any other thing which uh, uh, you know i can come across so i think this is the end of all of my slides uh thank you for your patient hearing yes so uh, i have a couple of questions so i'll just go through it i think latika uh, we have one yes. one uh, one question which has been posted here uh undergone cervical cerclage because of cervical incompetence then will we have a normal delivery is there any correlation so cervical incompetence obviously this uh, is where the cervix um, see cervix is a beautiful structure in the first half of pregnancy its role is to hold the uterus close okay it needs to uh, make sure that the uterus does not open and the pregnancy does not come out so that's the uh, role of cervix in the initial half in the latter half of pregnancy what it needs to do is it needs to soften nicely open up to allow the baby to come out so this has a dual function okay so generally what happens is incompetent cervix it depends on why how incompetence was diagnosed first of all and second of all um, there is no hard and fast rule that just because there is uh, uh, you know a cervical stitch that you should have a cesarean many a times a lot of women go into labor with cervical stitch in place at that time we generally remove the stitch and allow for normal delivery until and unless there is a strong contraindication for a normal delivery we should still be able to think about normal delivery with uh, cervical stitch obviously we need to take it out such patients in fact have shorter labor time as well that is what is documented but again it depends from person to person right now the next uh, one, yeah one more uh, question that is yes. that what is the minimum time to recover yeah. and also what is how to recover quickly okay so recover quickly i'm not uh, sure how quick uh, what what you have in the back of your mind uh, getting a cesarean done today and tomorrow if you're planning to go hiking to mount everest may not be possible i suppose so generally the recover period varies from person to person most commonly as i said by 
three days you should be back to your feet you should be able to do your routine work uh, simple cooking cleaning uh, at home and uh, um you know uh, taking care of your baby on your own breastfeeding activities all these things you should be able to do by the end of third day and complete recovery generally we say six weeks you know as in any other uh, situation for example even if a patient has had a normal delivery we say six weeks is the recovery time frame it is the same for this uh, exercise and things like that at the end of six weeks you should be able to start off no additional rest period for cesarean okay so we have this question that after c-section uh, what is the normal exercise uh, when can you resume to your exercise yeah so as i said any time between six weeks uh, to six to twelve weeks you can start resuming your exercise see it depends on why the cesarean was done as well for example let's say you know she is anemic and uh, you know she's developed some infection and complications after cesarean then definitely the recovery period will be more so in such people i all said and done, I, I still think three months should be the cutoff, not more than that. Six weeks ideally, but yes, let us be, uh, you know, a bit more compassionate and give uh, mom some time with her little one. Three months should be good enough. Okay. And in terms of exercises, it depends on the person, what uh, she is comfortable with. Because a lot of uh, young girls are very physically active even prior to pregnancy. So without any major issues, they should be able to go back to their, uh, you know, normal uh, uh, exercise regimes, what they were doing previously. But obviously, uh, the rule of thumb is listen to your body, how comfortable uh, you feel. Uh, you should do and start gradually it's not that you hit the gym on uh, day one and try to do a 10k it does not work that way so keep uh, established comfort zones for yourself and push a little bit harder as time passes by that's all perfect so i think doctor you have given us all the brief and the ppt was so well explained um but we do have some more questions yes. so when yes. should we plan for second pregnancy after the c-section yes so generally uh, what happens is uh, uh, you know the uterus should heal well we are not worried about the external scar on the tummy absolutely not so for the uterus to heal uh, it generally the best time um, uh, you know what is told is around two years so you can start thinking about pregnancy after two years because the scar would have healed quite well at that time yeah one more question 15 to 20 minutes walk is sufficient for gradual weight loss i'm not sure if that is sufficient if you're targeting weight yeah. loss, uh, you know i'm not sure if that is sufficient this is just uh, this uh, sort of uh, uh, you know the time frame what you have in the mind 15 to 20 minutes i'm not sure if it is uh, uh, it will have any impact on weight yes it will keep you more physically active it will keep, uh, make the lethargy go away and uh, you know for weight loss uh, i think if you're planning especially post uh, delivery weight loss if you are planning for that uh, you know then uh, probably uh, sometime uh, maybe you start off gradually with 30 minutes and that is more to do with uh, uh, you know what to say your diet rather than exercise yeah that is what is important right. okay so any more questions coming in all the viewers can dot it down quickly I think we have like everything is yeah. so much uh, cleared right now the ppt as i said was so like well informed and well knowledge now we all know like how and when and what are the circumstances and what are the situations to deal with and everything so it was a lovely session with you doctor thank and, you doctor. Uh, before like you know we sign off anything any small uh, message you would like to give out to all the ladies who are conceiving you know in this difficult time <laughs> No, just ask them. I, I would say take it easy. Don't be worried. COVID is not a disease which is known to be transmitted uh, in utero. Okay. It is uh, one of those simple viral upper respiratory infections, which has more complications than a normal virus. Uh, second thing is, you know, um, uh, 
delivery is not something which is in anybody's hands including the patient or the doctor so please be open minded don't be fixated because i see extreme of patients you know uh, one is like no i have to have a cesarean and the other one is like no i have to have a normal delivery unfortunately uh, these decisions have to make have to be made as and when the situation happens and arises so keep an open mind that is very 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 important and the second most important thing is in terms of uh, you know uh, all said and done all said and done vaginal delivery is the way humans are meant to give birth cesarean is something which we have developed for whatever reason okay uh, as uh, human kind with um, um, uh, probably more intelligence than what is required god has blessed us with that and we have come come up with this idea of cesarean so vaginal delivery is something which all of us should be looking forward for that is extremely important the, more, uh, the, the second thing is you know uh, our girls uh, you know need to learn a little bit of patience need to uh, learn a little bit of uh, methods to help cope them with uh, labor pain and all the uh, you know um, what to say the the, the scenario as papa they go through during the labor process including internal examination so women need to be mentally prepared for this and it's not that it is a simple easy process we all understand it is a difficult process but the more mentally you are prepared for it the better chances of actually a vaginal delivery at the end of the day and the other thing is obviously you know it's not that a woman gets one contraction and within the next minute she delivers it this never happens so be prepared for the time required for body to do things as well which could be anywhere between 10 to 14 hours so these are a few things which i want girls to keep in the back of their mind be open minded stay healthy exercise uh, follow a good diet that is more than sufficient true doctor i so agree with you and uh, yeah so this is like um, an entire package information that we have got today <laughs> on a saturday morning yeah i know i know so, right um, yeah before we sign off we will be playing some video uh, brought to you by our co brands that is life cell and philips thank you everyone every, every girl, girl dreams, dreams of becoming, becoming a mother, mother. And, and nothing, nothing. can be more fulfilling becoming, becoming parents, parents is the most, most exciting, exciting thing for anger than me and we're really looking, looking forward, forward to it so, so when our gynecologist, gynecologist told us about stem, stem cell banking, banking like a lot of people, people even we did, we did not know too much, much about it and so started doing our, our own research and realized how important, how important it is for us to bank the stem cells of our child as it ensures the protection of our little one against many future illnesses After doing our research, we chose to bank our child's stem cells with Life Cell International, as they have been in this space for 14 years and are the biggest and the best. Knowing that all three like parents have banked their child's stem cells with them, it was completely reassuring for us. What impressed us the most was their community banking program which we did not find anywhere as it ensures every member has a 96% chance of finding a stem cell match. Lifecell also covers the transplant surgery cost up to 20 lakhs and transports the stem cells free of cost to any hospital in the world. The program not only covers our child but also Anga than me and both our respective set of parents. And hey Who knows if there's a sibling on the way that one's covered too. The life cell representative gave me the stem cell collection kit. Now the best thing about this that it is so small and convenient that we can carry it along with us for the delivery. We've secured our child's future by preserving the stem cells with the life cell community banking program. What about you? Give your child this precious gift with life cell. A pregnancy away from my family, that too during the pandemic. It was my worst nightmare coming true. But who would have thought that I will find an extended family in the doctors and staff of Motherhood Hospital? They supported and cared for me, took care of my needs like a family. Frankly, even the pandemic never worried me. I knew somebody would be there to handle everything. 
my life's most important moment just the way i wanted it of course family would have made a cherry on top a dedicated hospital for women and children following 860 clinical and non clinical infection control protocols to keep you and your family safe at every step of care motherhood so yes ladies and gentlemen this was a lovely webinar with dr and i would like to take your leave and see you next week same time same place for a lovely session and to get rid of all your doubts that you have regarding pregnancies in this tough time thank you for being such lovely audience see you next week <laughs>